It's a terrible, terrible thing not to know what has happened to a loved one because you cannot close it. There's no final chapter. Uh, David L. Hurdlicka was shot down May 18, 1965, and he was captured. When I first found out that Jim was missing, I was upstairs with the little boys. Well, my husband, of course, was a Marine Corps helicopter pilot. Uh, he was shot down June 3rd of 1967 in Laos. At that time, we officially were not in the country of Laos. I had to decide how I would proceed, and I decided that I would proceed as if he were alive. Well, he was shot down on March 20th of 1966, and uh, I did not know that he was actually captured until July of 1966. It never occurred to me that the war would last very long. It just didn't seem possible to me that a little dinky country like North Vietnam could possibly hold out for very long against a power like the United States if we wanted to win the war. And I certainly thought we wanted to win the war. It would never occur to me that we would become involved in a war if we didn't want to win it as soon as possible. In the Vietnam War, American families with loved ones lost in combat faced an agonizing dilemma. Because America's adversaries in Southeast Asia refused to list or officially acknowledge holding any U.S. prisoners of war, POWs, it was impossible to know for certain who among those missing in action, MIA, was alive and who was dead. Meanwhile, President Lyndon Johnson encouraged a low profile on the war to protect the illusion of imminent victory in Vietnam. Living under a strict policy of silence at home, families of missing men could only hope that their loved ones might be alive somewhere in Southeast Asia. Wives of the few known prisoners of war were left to wonder when, if ever, they would make it home. We, as prisoners' wives, were told to keep quiet and not talk about the fact that our men were prisoners. Don't tell anybody that that was called, we called it the keep quiet policy. Government's policy, of course, was the best thing for our husbands uh, was to stay quiet on the subject. And we were afraid, from what we were told, that if we talked about it, I, I can remember even being told not to tell our neighbors. Never talk to the press. Don't tell anybody about your circumstance, if possible. Uh, uh, if you get any mail, show it to the Navy, and uh, never intercede yourself in any way in case you would disturb something the government is doing. Oh, they told me, they told me not to mention it. They told me that it was a secret war in Laos and do not mention it. It was a secret war in Laos that all the newspapers were talking about, but I wasn't supposed to mention it. We were told the rationale for this was that um, our men, any information that the press carried might be used against our men to um, torment them. Wives found themselves suddenly unable to participate in their tight-knit military communities and were isolated from the only other women who could truly understand their grief. We were not allowed to know the names of the other people in our circumstances. Of course, we were women without husbands, and uh, we were excluded uh, in a lot of things because uh, we didn't have a husband to go with to various functions. A lot of times they didn't know what to say to you. They didn't know quite what to say. In the beginning, even the officers' wives' clubs connected with the different bases uh, were very hesitant to get involved because the, the policy had been uh, to not say anything or do anything for so long that I think a lot of them were afraid that if they got involved with us, it perhaps would hurt their husband's career. So it got to be where there were about 10, 15 of us women around here that, that no longer had husbands. And we made the other wives very uncomfortable, which I can understand why, because they looked at us and they said, oh my gosh, that can be me. It was, uh, first of all, a torturing prison. They always tortured you alone. They would take you, uh, they would slap you around and then take you into an interrogating room. And the way it was done was basically to bind your arms in ways that shut off the blood circulation to your upper body and then to administer excruciating pain by having your 
arms bound behind you where your uh, shoulder blades were touching. I set out to get our own government to acknowledge that we had prisoners who were being mistreated in North Vietnam. Johnson knew this would emotionally involve the American people in the war, and they did not want to do that. They wanted to keep the people as separated from the war as possible. I'm gone away, baby, but I'll be back someday. Uncle Sam need me. I gotta go to Vietnam. If freedom is to survive in any American hometown, it must be preserved in such places as South Vietnam. And as President Johnson has pointed out, it is up to us. President Johnson's escalation of the war in Vietnam led to more captured and missing Americans and rapidly increased the number of POW MIA families scattered across the country. I gotta go to Vietnam. You have mothers and fathers and wives, and, and with the military service, you have primary next of kin and secondary next of kin. The wife is the primary next of kin, the mother and father are the secondary next of kin. Things don't always go well between daughters-in-law and mothers-in-law, and having the daughter-in-law be the primary next of kin, that meant she got all the information and the only information the secondary next of kin his mother got was what she passed on and if she didn't like her very well sometimes she didn't pass it on in the summer of 1966 u.s pow's were marched at gunpoint through the streets of hanoi in this propaganda film giving american wives their first opportunity to identify selected prisoners of war Vietnam's ongoing torture of their husbands and its threat to execute them as war criminals galvanized wives such as Sybil Stockdale to action. One wife, Patsy Creighton, called me after several months and she said, some of us would like to get together. So I invited everybody here for lunch and that was, I believe it was the 6th or 7th of October, 1966, and there were 13 of us here. Everybody was so relieved to be talking to someone else in the same circumstance. And there was such a sharing of information and such an outpouring of what the government had told this one and that one and the other one. Would they, we, just couldn't, we just couldn't part. Sybil Stockdale's home became a hub of activity for POW MIA wives. She produced a newsletter that passed from wife to wife along an expanding circle of POW MIA families. In the following months, the women wrote letters to Washington asking what was being done to help their husbands. But their individual queries got no results. The women organized their informal group as the League of Wives of American Vietnam Prisoners of War. We elected officers and I had our secretary write a letter to the State Department or the, and the Defense Department to see if someone would come here to San Diego to talk to us. And Governor Harriman's assistant, Frank Sieverts, came out here to talk to us in three weeks after the organization's letter went. So we were very impressed with the fact that an organization was the way to go and that was the only way we were going to get things done. My first recollection of meeting Sybil Stockdale was the um, Department of Defense held a, a meeting for the wives and, and families down in San Diego and uh, those of us that were in the Los Angeles area went down there and of course this was the first time I'd realized how many wives there were in San Diego and they already had had gotten together as a group being they were pretty much in the same locale and and were doing much the same thing I was doing and uh, you know we'd say oh have you have you uh, written or talked on the phone to so and so yes I have and pretty soon we began to realize that we uh, on our own were putting together a pretty good network Bob Burroughs, a helpful Navy intelligence officer, quickly introduced POW MIA wives to the realities of dealing with Washington. The fact that Commander Burroughs uh, asked me to wear a hidden microphone and tape recorder at a meeting by, that the State Department and the Defense Department were going to have for us wives 
made me feel even more uneasy. He said, I said, why would you want me to do that? He said, I want to hear what you're going to what they're going to tell you. I said, my goodness, you're all in the same government. Isn't everybody working together? And he said, not necessarily. And so twice I wore uh, a wire, so to speak. And it was, it was exciting, very exciting. And he found it extremely worthwhile, which I found very interesting. But publicly, it was still business as usual. The wives saw no concrete action on their concerns. Mr. Johnson reflects his keen interest as he inspects weapons and uniforms captured from the Viet Cong. LBJ enjoys his piece of cake as he chats with the disabled veterans of the fighting in Vietnam. For the president, a memorable occasion. And many wives learned that truth often took a back seat to the political complexities of the war. And so even, even when uh, men from his squadron came home and I tried to contact them and find out as much as I could about the circumstances surrounding his loss, uh, they couldn't even tell me that it was Laos. And I remember specifically one of his squadron mates coming home and uh, we spread a map out on the floor and he couldn't even say it, but he pointed to the exact spot where he knew Steve had gone down over the border into the country of Laos. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. As the Vietnam War ultimately overcame the Johnson administration, more wives spoke out publicly about their plight in open defiance of the keep quiet policy. Bob Dornan, who was an Air Force fighter pilot himself uh, in Korea, and had a talk show, a local talk show in Los Angeles at the time. And he contacted me and, and was very supportive and understanding and asked me if I wanted to be on his TV talk show. The Marine Corps was very nervous about me going on this TV program and so they sent a Marine Corps officer with me that sat out in the audience and, and I guess just kind of kept tabs of what I was going to say and uh, thinking back on that. Uh, after we, of course, got so active and were doing so much, the military didn't have enough people to keep track of all of us as time went on. Because it's something that grows worse every single day. Both men are in worse condition as each day goes by. Or maybe my husband's been dead one more day since he was shot down. I don't think people comprehend that every day means so very much. The more wives spoke up, the more they saw how many others shared their situation. As time went on, um, our organization really became refined in response to specific events. I'm thinking particularly about the election of President Nixon in 1968. We wanted to send telegrams to President Nixon on the day of his inauguration, asking him to give the prisoner situation a high priority in his administration. We had 2,000 telegrams on his desk the day after his inauguration. The telegram episode proved to Sybil Stockdale and others that together they had a voice louder than any government gag order. What we need is a national organization to attract the attention of the national media. And so, um, in my rather carefree way, I gave the organization the name of the National League of Families of American Prisoners and Missing in Southeast Asia. And we were, and I proclaimed, and I was the national coordinator as self-appointed. Yes, um, we want to secure the protection of the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war for the men. Hanoi signed this convention in 1957 and in effect gave their promise to the world that in case of any armed conflict, even if they didn't recognize it as an armed conflict, that they would protect any men they took as prisoners and they have violated every basic tenet of this convention. Under pressure from POW MIA families, the hated keep quiet policy was dropped by Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird in a press conference on May 19, 1969. For the first time, the United States publicly listed the number of men it believed to be prisoner and stated that it would hold North Vietnam accountable for their fate. 
Laird demanded an end to the torture of prisoners and urged that the enemy's prison facilities be open to international inspection. The Nixon administration launched a public relations strategy of wide publicity about prisoners of war. Suddenly, POWs and MIAs were elevated from obscurity into a major war issue. While the persistence of the wives was paying dividends, the political dimensions of the Go Public campaign were also evident. I will always believe that the administration changed its policy uh, because they could see the handwriting on the wall. The, the wives were organizing to a point that uh, we were becoming a factor, I think, and we were going to speak out anyway. And uh, certainly that aspect helped push the administration, I think, to changing their uh, policy in May of 69. The government then began to get behind and develop programs of their own that would, would favor uh, gaining humane treatment for the prisoners. Um, sometimes I felt quite convinced that they were, the government was behind things that they didn't necessarily acknowledge. Representatives from the National League of Families were soon granted a meeting with President Nixon. What I have assured uh, these very courageous women is this government will do everything that it possibly can to separate out the prisoner issue and have it handled as it should be uh, as a separate issue on a humane basis. But the League wanted more than photo opportunities. The women demanded regular contact with those responsible for the fates of their husbands and secured a private briefing from Henry Kissinger, Nixon's key advisor on Vietnam. Kissinger realized what he was up against when he sent a subordinate, Alexander Haig, in his place to the appointment with the wives. Well, we didn't know General Haig from a hole in the ground. So we met with General Haig and he had one group, a very, a large group of very, very angry wives. And I mean, we were shouting. We don't think you're important in this government and we don't want to talk to you. And then everybody took up the, the uh, complaint around the room. And that, I think, amazed uh, most of the military men because we were military wives. All, our husbands were all professional military wives and professional military wives don't act that way. And I could see the rivulets of perspiration coming down the sides of his face and he put his hand in his pocket and he was jiggling his hand around in his pocket. And finally, after this had gone on for some time, I said to him, are we communicating with you? Do you understand what we're saying to you? Do you realize that we are angry? And he said, yes, Mrs. Stockdale. He said, uh, you certainly have communicated with me. He said, you've com com communicated so well with me that I've worn a hole in my pants pocket and all my change is on the floor. And we looked down and here was all this money down here on the floor. And when we talked to Dr. Kissinger the next time, Dr. Kitchen Kissinger said, what did you do to my general? <laughs> It was a long, hard struggle to involve the American people. Getting people to, first off, understand the issue, and secondly, to care, was not an easy job. And this is what we want the country to recognize. There is an urgency, tremendous urgency for our men. Some of them have been there six governments, seven years. We accomplished a lot as, as women, just as a woman's organization, because we really did this. I mean, there were a few fathers uh, that were involved, but not that many. I mean, this was really a woman's organization. The League's campaign of concern for American POWs and MIAs generated a fantastic level of public support. Family members organized events nationwide to focus attention on those missing and captured in enemy territory and to rally condemnation of North Vietnam. For many Americans, the prisoners quickly transcended other issues of the war and came to symbolize the righteousness of the American cause in Vietnam. This matter of our men must be a, a personal matter of top priority and commitment to those men, not only for the sake of those men, but for the sake of America as well. We were in malls, we were all over, and we had so many people help us. 
I mean, it was amazing. Not only military people, but all kinds of people. Um, and we would have people writing letters, and we got them, collected them all here. And I know the mayor got them and flew over to Paris with them and delivered bags and bag loads. And that embarrassed them. That did embarrass the North Vietnamese. And I had determined that the one thing the North Vietnamese responded to was public opinion. They did not want to be thought of as a barbarian country. On a crest of public notoriety, groups of POW MIA wives traveled to the peace talks on the war held in Paris, where they confronted the North Vietnamese delegation. Others went directly to the war zone in search of information about their husbands. Unfortunately for the wives, their efforts yielded no answers. We received no information concerning our husbands. We feel that the trip was a success to the degree that we are the first wives that we know of in modern history who have met with the enemy during a time of war. In 1970, the National League of Families, now representing some 3,000 POW MIA family members, officially incorporated and established its headquarters in Washington, D.C. 60 million letters on behalf of the prisoners had been generated in just three years. Though Hanoi remained outwardly defiant, the strategy of sustained public pressure had significant and welcome effects for the POWs. This league was what saved our neck. Sybil was in Paris uh, with, uh, with, on behalf of the League of Families. And the last thing they wanted was me dead because everybody, I, my picture had been in the paper and so uh, that's to her I owe my life and to uh, the good fortune of the prisoners, uh, the, the torture petered out over a time of several weeks. Back in California, Organizers of Voices in Vital America, a conservative student group better known as Viva, designed a thin band of metal which personally bound millions of Americans to the POW MIA crusade. It was amazing, the outpouring of, of public interest in these, and I guess because it had somebody's name and people wanted to know about this person, and here was this bracelet they weren't supposed to take off. There's something about the physical touch on the on the skin that you're wearing something and of course it had the name too you're carrying someone's name and you couldn't help but think of a person in a dark dismal cell that uh, with not enough food and beaten and so on the bracelet captured public imagination and became a ubiquitous symbol of concern for POWs and MIAs somewhere at home a woman just a wildly successful program, wildly successful. People love them, and to this day, they'll get emotional about them. I do believe that the POW bracelet was the one single item that most connected the American people with the issue. People would pledge to wear this until the man came home. And a lot of people took this very, very seriously and it did it indeed wear them um, until the man came home. This is one of the original POW MIA bracelets that Viva Voices in Vital America made. I've had this one on since 1972, June 4th. You shouldn't do this, but I did it because these were the cheap ones and they broke, so I had it soldered on by the jeweler and you could see how it's worn down. I had no idea I'd still be wearing it 20, almost 27 years later. I wore mine. Um, my, the man on my bracelet did not come home alive, and it wasn't until the mid-'80s his body was recovered in Vietnam and sent home, but I wore the bracelet until that time. Ironically, the bracelet even found its way into enemy territory. One of these men lost in 1972, an American pilot actually was wearing a bracelet when he was shot down over North Vietnam. And he told POWs about this. And some of them said later on that they had heard about some people wearing bracelets with their names on them. But for the life of them, they really couldn't figure out what on earth they were talking about. They'd heard some rumors in the camps. And, uh, I, you know, you could imagine it was a concept that we now take for granted maybe because it's happened. But in those days, it just 
didn't seem to make any sense to them, and they had no real idea of the massive public awareness campaign that would, had gone on in this country. Stop and think for a moment, all of you out there. There are men existing, there are men dying in those prison camps right now. Their own hope is that you will help them. Stop, think for a moment, and then do what you can to help them. Television and newspaper appeals exhorted Americans to identify personally with POWs and MIAs. Am I forgotten? Will the only freedom I will ever know again be the freedom of death? I am an American prisoner of war, and I cry out, does anyone remember me? And it was very difficult for anyone to say, oh, well, we shouldn't be concerned about your husband. So uh, it was kind of a, you know, America apple pie uh, situation in the beginning. Unfortunately, that didn't hold because it got smack dab in the middle of the political arena. As the war dragged on, President Nixon recognized the value in maintaining the loyalty of the POW MIA movement in the face of changing public attitudes toward the war. No presidential statement on Vietnam would be complete without an expression of our concern for the fate of the American prisoners of war. The callous exploitation of the anxieties and anguish of the parents, the wives, the children of these brave men as negotiating pawns is an unforgivable breach of the elementary rules of conduct between civilized peoples. Images of captive Americans, both real and imagined, could be employed to counter critics of his war policies. And patriotic military wives standing faithfully by their men provided a stark contrast to the protesters and radicals making the evening news. This group, um, for the most part, they were military wives. We were not the kind that, that got out in the street and protested. That, that ran against the grain of, of a military wife. But through 1971 and 72, the League of Families was nearly destroyed by internal dissent and division. Annual meeting that we had when I was chairman of the League was probably the most difficult of all of them because by this time uh, the families were very splintered. Um, there were as many opinions as to what we should do as a, as a country as there were family members out there. Uh, in 1972 particularly it was an election year and some of the families had come out in support of uh, President Nixon's rival George McGovern and and uh, I think some of the League people who were very, very pro-Nixon uh, maybe were concerned that we weren't, and we were just trying to stay non-political. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not willing to sacrifice my husband for a cause that no one believes in. I feel that he, if he is alive, has suffered a great deal. I don't want to throw out everything that he sacrificed. What I don't understand is any benefit it brings to this country. Yes, he said that he was going to try to separate the prisoner issue out from the political issues, which of course it really is a completely separate issue. You cannot separate the issue of ending the war and the prisoners' release. Several members of the League felt that the only way to go was to publicly criticize the government. I was extremely opposed to that because I thought that would put would be such a feather in the enemy's cap. Discord in the POW MIA movement peaked when dissident family members formed a new organization called Families for Immediate Release. Representing a minority faction within the League, the group favored setting a date for American withdrawal from Vietnam in return for the release of the prisoners and strongly opposed Nixon's re-election bid in 1972. Well, there, there were two groups really basically that split off because they felt that the League of Families was not focusing on the political issue. 
they were still fo focusing on the humanitarian issue, which was treat our hu husbands well, treat the prisoners well, get inspections. And uh, by the time 71 came, we were a little tired of that. Well, the New Hampshire primary is in March. And I feel that if those prisoners are not negotiated out of there by then, that there's going to be a POW wife on every street corner in this country. The next step is just simply Washington. We have to um, meet with these people in Washington and make them realize that the only way we'll ever get our husbands back alive is through a change in policy. And if it comes now, it may save their lives. America has never been defeated in the proud 190-year history of this country. And we shall not be defeated in Vietnam. The prospect of the POW MIA movement turning against him worried Nixon. The political stakes of the popular yet volatile prisoner issue rose each week the war continued. Grassroots campaigning by the National League of Families and behind the scenes efforts by the Nixon White House had succeeded in turning the prisoners into a paramount issue of the war. But the issue was becoming difficult to manage and threatened to spin out of control as families ran low on patience with the government. It became a very difficult uh, position for me as chairman of the league to try and, and keep these families uh, you know, in the league and uh, maintain our relationship with government because at that time, of course, they were only dealing with the league. and. Uh, I didn't want the League to disenfranchise itself with the government or where would we be then? Certainly the uh, Nixon White House was very interested and watched very closely what was going on. And there's often been um, speculation as to the families were going to organize anyway and I think that the White House wanted in some ways to be helpful to them but also to try to make sure that this did not turn out to be some loose cannon group that was running around. and. Uh, denouncing the president. They wanted definitely to be able to have these people on their side. Uh, president Nixon, of course, we had, we had asked if he would come and, and speak at, at our convention. And uh, I was in touch with various members of State Department and DOD at the time. And I can remember of getting a phone call, must have been about 3 o'clock in the morning from one of the contacts in the Department of Defense that I work closely with. And uh, he said, do you think if the president appears tomorrow night at your banquet, do you think uh, you know, the families are, are going to make s such a scene that it will be embarrassing to the president? And I said, no, I think that uh, we as a group wouldn't do that. He is the commander-in-chief of our husbands. He's the president of the United States, and I, I think I can assure you that, you know, he will be received as the way he should be. In a raucous League of Families National Convention, the organization closed ranks behind the administration, voting to maintain a strictly humanitarian focus and to forego public criticism of the president. We shall, under no circumstances, abandon our POWs and our MIAs, wherever they are. We had no choice in my mind but to support the administration that was in a position to end the war and bring the men home. Having promised peace with honor, the repatriation of all POWs, and an accounting of those missing in action, Richard Nixon went on to win the 1972 presidential election in a landslide. Within three months, the U.S. and Vietnam signed the Paris Peace Accords, ending American military involvement in Vietnam. The war had cost the United States more than 58,000 lives and untold billions of dollars. 591 U.S. POWs were released in what was known as Operation Homecoming. Some like the husbands of Sybil Stockdale and Louise Mulligan, had been in captivity for eight years. They came home as heroes to a nation well primed for their return. TV coverage of prisoners' arrival saturated the airwaves. The POWs were showered with free cars, season baseball tickets, and lifetime golf club memberships. 
Major corporations, under an arrangement with the Defense Department, lined up to offer the men choice employment opportunities. POW wives, on the other hand, received corsages, compliments of the President. Families were reunited. A war was over. But troubling questions remained for more than 2,500 families whose loved ones were still missing in action. How many prisoners were coming home? That was a big question in the minds of the families, and especially the families like myself, where uh, our husbands were listed as missing. There was a list of POWs that the North Vietnamese had finally given up. Uh, but we were certain that all, the, all of the men were not on that list. So what was going to happen to them? Those with loved ones believed to still be alive somewhere in Southeast Asia waited anxiously for further information about them, expecting the government to make good on its promise of a full accounting. Operation Homecoming, I was, I was very happy for the, the families that had gotten their answers and that their loved ones came home, but I was still waiting to hear what had happened to David Hurtlicka. I wanted to know what happened to David Hurtlicka. And they were telling me, just wait, we'll find out. The war ended and people were very concerned that we didn't have back all the prisoners. And this was an overwhelming concern of many of us. And the League, many of them gave up and stopped involvement in the issue. Well, I think that, um, as I said before, we, we had a big job to do just to get our husbands uh, back into society. Well, what aggravated us the other pe the families. We had worked six, seven years in this issue to try to get their husbands out. And they pledged that they would continue to support us. They also pledged that they would get their husbands, the return POWs, to support us. Well, I felt very strongly that after Jim came home that if I were an MIA wife that I would not want a POW wife whose husband was already home to come down and be telling me how I should proceed with my husband still missing. You had situations where men were coming back into homes um, with children who had grown up, totally grown up. My oldest son was, had graduated from college when my husband came home. My youngest child was 10 and a half years old. He hadn't seen his father since he was three. It was for them to decide what they were going to do. And I have not always agreed with everything that they've done, but I will say I have tremendous admiration for their um, determinism to keep going. Though weakened by the loss of many of its key founders and organizers, those who remained in the National League were convinced the fight was not yet over. Well, the thing is, most of the families that knew that they had captive family members were shocked, of course, when they said they're all dead. Because none of us had been told they were all dead before President Nixon said it on TV. But after manipulating the issue of POWs and MIAs to its advantage throughout the war by keeping their total number and identities a mystery, how could families be sure Vietnam was now telling the whole truth on the matter? We had to make sure that our government was going to demand a full accounting to the very best you know, possible. Uh, and as an example, the crew member from my husband's helicopter was never on a list was never, mail was never received from him. There were never any photographs of him, and yet he came home. Yet they found their appeals were now unwelcome in the political climate of post-war Washington. Gone were the days of family access to and assistance from the government. They had used us from 70 to 73 for three years. They had gotten out of us what they wanted out of us, and that was the vehicle for public, uh, relations and uh, so it was to their best advantage now that we've used you we're through with you thank you very much that's it they analyzed they told us what we should think they told us only what they wanted us to know they didn't give us the whole story in the congress they would say women just wanted to be in it because they could get their husband's paycheck or that the people being involved in this issue were just all a bunch of crazy lunatics and a bunch of activists who didn't know when to give up or go home. 
But there was a whole decline in the whole country of interest in Vietnam. It had been a, a long, prolonged, dreadful experience, really, for uh, the United States. And people didn't really want to think too much about the war. Well, <clears throat> our main efforts at that time, after the war, was trying to get uh, public awareness going to rebut what the U.S. government was saying, that there were no men alive. When we first started, the government supported us in many ways. They were able to obtain free office space in the uh, American Legion building in Washington for our office. They installed a bank of telephones, which cost us nothing. The government installed them and paid the expense of them. Uh, they appointed an advisory group which sat in on the board. They were a group of government officials from various agencies. After the war was over and after we became adversarial to the government, all of that stopped. Not only did they discontinue any contributions to the League, but they came into the League office and pulled out that bank of telephones that the government had originally installed, uh, trying to put the, the uh, squeeze on us financially. But the POW MIA movement would not simply disappear. Now controlled primarily by families of over 2,000 MIAs, the National League sharply criticized the Nixon administration for its failure to secure an accounting of the missing and resolve cases in which evidence suggested men might be alive and yet did not appear on enemy captured lists. And he was held in Sam Nui in the caves and he was interviewed several times during his captivity by Ivan Shedroff, who was a Russian reporter. And they, had, they took a picture immediately of David's capture. And uh, there was a tape recording, and he wrote a letter to the, the Prince of Laos asking for his release. And he was well documented in captivity. Unresolved cases sparked renewed action by family members and gave many a new perspective on their beliefs. A 30-year Army veteran, I believed in my country. I believed in my government. Uh, during the anti-war demonstrations, I was uh, vastly opposed to it. I despised the people that got out there and... Uh, uh, destroyed the American flag and degraded the American flag that flew the Vietnam flag and I just didn't like them at all and uh, I was just not one for a demonstrator and then uh, after the war when I knew that there was nothing being done uh, by the government to get our live POWs out and our families knew there was nothing being done and we sought the demonstration route to bring attention to the POW issue. And the first time I uh, walked as part of a demonstration in front of the White House was the toughest thing I had ever done. I still really haven't had a, a total answer on my husband, and chances are I ne never will. Uh, and that's why the issue never really goes away. I mean, it's still there. and. For me, um, I mean, his remains still could be returned, which would be a blessing to me. The thing is, I know David was alive. There's no evidence that he died. So what does that leave me? And until I see the evidence, I can't believe he's dead. Like the prisoners who returned in Operation Homecoming, the POW MIA movement also survived Vietnam. In the coming decades, the movement's search for Americans who disappeared in their country's longest war would keep alive difficult questions about soldiers left behind in Southeast Asia. Assuming an increasingly radical image, the POW MIA movement would also come to dominate America's cultural memory of Vietnam, define the bitterness of its experience there, and remain an explosive force on the national scene. Its famous black and white flag stands as a symbol of its resolve to unlock the fate of those still among the missing and bring them home.